Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Naomi Funahashi, and I'm with the Stanford Program on International and Cross-Cultural Education at SPICE at Stanford University. Um, it's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for our webinar today. And um, I, before I introduce our speakers for today, um, Ms. Catherine Tolbert and Ms. Waka Takahashi Brown, I'd like to just share a little bit about SPICE and what we do. Um, so SPICE is a K-12 focused um, with also community college focused education program that's based at the Freeman Spogli Institute on International Studies at, in, at Stanford University. And there are sort of three components within the field of education that we focus on primarily. Uh, the first is curriculum development. And so you'll see a little bit of that here today um, in our curriculum demonstration that you'll um, be seeing a little bit later on. And then we also do teacher professional development, um, which is where we try to uh, introduce our curriculum materials and guide teachers through um, different ideas and um, pedagogical sort of um, uh, ideas and how to integrate the curriculum into their own classrooms and their own teaching. And then we also do online teaching to students in the US and Japan and in China at the moment. Um, so if you'd like to learn any uh, more about our existing programs, um, please take a look at our website. Um, but today we are here to hear about um, the teaching of a particular history uh, through uh, different multimedia resources. And so we are thrilled today to be joined by Ms. Catherine Tolbert, um, whom uh, has developed, has just these incredible resources, um, the documentary film that you'll be hearing a little bit more about in a little bit, and you'll see a little bit of today, and also this incredible oral history archive. And so we hope that you'll be able to take some of the stories and the resources that are shared here today and integrate them into your teaching um, within the different contexts and audiences within which you teach and your communities. Okay, um, so I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker today, uh, Ms. Catherine Tolbert. Uh, she is a former editor and a reporter on the Metro, National and Foreign Desks uh, at the Washington Post and was a correspondent in Tokyo and director of recruiting and hiring as well. She has also worked for the Boston Globe and the Associated Press. And she has also written about Japanese women who married American servicemen after World War II, which is what we'll be hearing about today. And she co-directed the film Fall Seven Times, Get Up Eight, The Japanese War Brides. She is a graduate of Vassar College with a degree in political science and a master's in international relations from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Um, this particular story uh, is, I think will resonate with a lot of people because it's not just about these individual um, lives that we hear about, but there are so many universal themes, I think that all of us um, can really be inspired by. Uh, and this is a story uh, that is really personal to me, uh, my own grandmother, uh, was also one of these Japanese women who had the courage to um, to move to a new country, a new culture uh, with a new language. Uh, she was a war bride as well. And so um, this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart and my family's heart. And I'm thrilled that um, that Catherine has taken the time to research and develop all of these incredible resources so that more students um, through teachers like you uh, can learn about them um, and think a little bit about how, uh, you know, the power of learning history through personal narrative. Um, so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So I'll go ahead and turn my camera off so that you can hear and see Catherine and I'll begin uh, sharing my screen. Thank you for joining us. Oh, and also mention um, that we will have time for Q&A at the end today. So if you have questions that come up um, during Catherine's presentation or during Waka's presentation uh, a little bit later, um, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A and we will have a chance to address them at the end of our session. Okay, thank you so much. Catherine, I'll go ahead and pass the microphone over to you. I think that you may be muted. Great. Hi, thanks so go. much. Right. And uh, I do have a slideshow. Uh, so if we could uh, get that first uh, image up for uh, for the War Bride project, uh, that would be that would be great. Thank you. 
so um, I, I'm, I'm really, uh, I thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, I'm so grateful that Stanford's program on international and cross-cultural education decided to produce a curriculum unit and teacher's guide for the Japanese War Bride Project. Having educators use the stories in this oral history archive is such an important way to give them broader reach and impact. I'd like to start by noting that foreign women married U.S. servicemen during and after all the major wars of the last century, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. My focus is World War II and the Japanese, because those were the first large numbers of interracial marriages at a time when they were illegal in most of the United States and when Asian immigrants were banned from entry. It's remarkable when you think about it. Asian immigration stopped with the 1924 Immigration Act. And when the door was opened in 1952, the first large group to enter were Japanese women. My mother came to the United States that year. For the past eight years, and uh, I think we moved to slide two, thank you. Uh, for the past eight years, I have been interviewing Japanese war brides and their families to create an oral history archive of their stories. Today, there are 44 stories on the website, ranging in length from a little under four minutes to just over 15 minutes. Each one tells a different slice of the war bride experience, from chance meetings in post-war Japan to their struggles and successes in the many scattered communities where they made their homes. This work started out as a personal story because my mother is a Japanese war bride who met my father when she worked as a sales girl at a PX store in Tokyo. They married in 1951 and went to his family home the following year, an upstate New York poultry farm. As the firstborn, I was the child who was to fulfill my mother's dreams. She placed all her hope on my success as a student, as a journalist. I think it's true in many immigrant families. And while ours wasn't a typical immigrant family and that my father was a local farm boy, my mother had the immigrant's ambition and striving to get ahead. And it was her strength that defined our family. It wasn't until very late in my journalism career that I turned my focus inward toward my own family. I was very interested in Japan and interest my mother encouraged. So I began to study Japanese in college and did my junior year abroad in Tokyo at Waseda University. After graduating, I began my journalism career in Tokyo with the Associated Press. Decades later, I thought of writing about my mother and recorded about six hours of interviews with her. She was happy to oblige and willingly recalled all that she could about her childhood, teenage years, and early life in the United States. But when I tried to make sense of her story, I was stumped. Was her story unique? What was her place in the history of the United States and Japan? The answer I found was in the stories of other families. In 2015, with a grant from Vassar College, I took a leave of absence from my job at the Washington Post and began to travel around the country interviewing Japanese war brides, their husbands, and their families. I found them through social media and one family often led to another. Sometimes the Japanese mother was reluctant to be interviewed and had to be talked into it by her children who wanted to know her story. It was a remarkable experience for me as a journalist to record long interviews with people who reach back into their past to remember what they saw, how they felt. I recorded their stories and scanned their old family photos. What I discovered was that understanding family history is a way of understanding a nation's history. The way these marriages took place, at first despite strenuous objections and administrative barriers, and later with the blessing of U.S. officials, mirrors the changing relationship between Japan and the United States. Japan was quickly transformed from enemy to ally and the war brides were seen as the soft face of Japan. But in addition to playing a role in the changing relationship between Japan and the US, the war brides and their families occupied a particular place in the US racial mix. Except for the marriages between Nisei or second generation Japanese American men and Japanese women, the war bride marriages were considered mixed race. In 1945, more than half the states had anti-miscegenation laws, making interracial marriage illegal. In the post-war period, more than a dozen states repealed those laws and the rest were invalidated in 1967 by the Supreme Court ruling in Loving versus Virginia. 
Japanese women were confused over where they fit in black and white America. My colleague Lucy Kraft's parents recounted that when confronted with white or colored bathrooms, her mother asked her father which one she should use. He replied, I don't know, try the white one and see if anyone objects. The women were often the first Japanese in their communities and their children sometimes struggled to find their place. I thought Sidney Jordan said it very well in the story called Kino in Reno. Japanese war brides were trailblazers basically in the area that they came to this country because it was so many of them and they were so dispersed throughout the United States and they had to deal with the different, different states they were in and each state is different in their uh, social outlook on, on things. America wasn't ready for that. He and Kasako, who were married in 1951, navigated segregated America. Driving in the South, she would slink down in her seat during the day so that no one could see her and mistake her for a white woman. In working with Spice on how to present this material, which tells history through personal stories, we came up with five lessons. The first one gives background on the war brides and distinguishes them from picture brides who came to the U.S. at the turn of the century through around 1920 as brides of Japanese laborers. The context for the war bride story is how World War II and its aftermath set the stage for personal relationships. When you hear the stories from the women who were in their teens at the end of the war in 1945, who saw their mothers die in the firebombing of cities or who barely escaped the Hiroshima atomic bomb blast, you wonder what they thought of Americans. These are women whose schools were turned into factories toward the end of the war, who made war material. My mother's high school gymnasium is where she learned how to rivet part of the Zero fighter plane's wings. They were taught to believe in the war and the inevitability of Japan's victory. And yet, after the shock of defeat, for many it was, in just a few years, a kind of liberation. Under General Douglas MacArthur, the Allied occupation set up a vast infrastructure of bases, depots, and camps in every prefecture in the country. They employed Japanese women as clerks, typists, waitresses, babysitters, and in the surrounding neighborhoods, women also found work in the bars and dance halls that catered to the young soldiers, airmen, and sailors. Women worked. They had to, to help support their families. Many families had been left without fathers or sons. The Americans provided a way out for these young women, not only with jobs, but with the idea of a different kind of life. Yuriko Ishigaki survived Hiroshima because she overslept that day and wasn't at work in her office in what is today the atomic bomb dome. But despite that horrific experience, she eventually married an American. She had marriage offers from Japanese men, but she said she didn't want the kind of marriage her parents had. Her mother deferred to her father and never stood up for herself. I heard this a number of times, that American men represented a kind of freedom to these women. Here's what Akiko Hewitt said. It's a part of my something new, something more than what I have now. I was born in a very strict family, more like a samurai family. And it was very lim limited for the thinking and doing. Um, as a teenager, I wanted to do more things. And uh, uh, more I learned from him, there was something that uh, out there, something I have never seen or did. And uh, that attracted me. In the second lesson, we introduced Japanese immigration to the United States. Marriages between European and Australian women and U.S. servicemen began during the war. The 1945 War Brides Act made it possible for them to enter the U.S., and in 1946, some 70,000 British brides arrived in the U.S. with much publicity. The legislation did not apply to Japanese or other Asians who were banned from entry by the 1924 Immigration Act. But within the first two years of occupation, U.S. military men were already petitioning to marry their Japanese girlfriends. 
permission was denied in all but a few cases. During the occupation years, Japanese women were admitted to the U.S. on a case-by-case -case basis. Kimiko Amato, for example, entered as the fiancé of Angelo Amato of East Boston by a special act of Congress, a bill introduced by Congressman John F. Kennedy. And here, among the papers that the family keeps is the letter, one of the letters that uh, that John F. Kennedy wrote saying that uh, he's a I'm pleased to advise you that the bill in her behalf was passed in the Senate yesterday without amendment. It will now be sent to the president for signature, and I'm hopeful that it will be enacted into law in the near future. With kind regards, I am sincerely yours, John Kennedy. Under pressure for, uh, by servicemen, though, President Truman did grant a 30-day period in 1947 for marriages to be approved and visas issued if couples could complete the extensive paperwork. Finally, in 1952, U.S. immigration law changed. The McCarran-Walter Act allowed Asians to become naturalized U.S. citizens and therefore eligible to enter the U.S. That year, 4,220 Japanese brides entered. You can see from this immigration chart how the numbers changed starting in that year. Japan is the first column showing that in 1947, there were 14 wives admitted to the U.S. And going up to 1952, uh, there's that 4,220 number, uh, the, the year when uh, the most brides began to come. Lesson three covers the transmission of culture, with food being one of the key themes. Through food, we see both the longing for home and the sharing of culture. The import and sale of Kikoman soy sauce, for example, grew dramatically in the early 1950s as Japanese women began to cook and share the food they grew up with. Kikuman soy sauce and rice were the staples in these homes. Admiral Harry Harris said of his mother when they lived in rural Tennessee for the first decade of her life in the U.S. Um, and my mother would take the vegetables that she grew and try to do something Japanese with them. Uh, you know, she would make uh, sushi with cucumbers and rice uh, and that kind of stuff. So she would she would turn the stuff that we could grow in Tennessee. I say we. I was a, I was a little kid then, but that they could grow and pickle it and and all of that and try to try to turn it uh, into something that uh, reminded my mother of home. I grew up eating that. Uh, I loved it, uh, and I still have a taste and affinity uh, for Japanese food today because of that, uh, and especially Kikkoman, uh soy sauce. He said his friends came over for rice balls with sesame seeds and liked them. Kasuko and Leo Kingsbury settled on a dairy farm in upstate New York. Their daughter Esther remembers buying soy sauce and seaweed in a small Asian food store in Binghamton, where they sold Kikuman soy sauce. And so she'd get this big gallon of Kikuman shoyu, and then sometimes we'd get a real treat and we'd get some nori too, a little bit of nori, you know, because it was very expensive. And so it was a treat. And I mean, maybe once a month, but mom would um, stretch the shoyu uh, with, cut it with vinegar. And we, and they, we didn't have, and you didn't have rice vinegar. You only had, you know, vinegar. So you would cut it, and it's funny because we grew up that way, so we still do. It's interesting that in 1973, when Kikuman published a book on how to cook with soy sauce, the cover photograph showed a mixed race family. It looks like a Japanese mother and a white father. There are many examples of the ways Japanese war brides spread culture through demonstrations in schools and featured in newspaper articles. It was part of the new friendly Japan, the US ally. You can see here Hiroi Shibata Hasna at a show and tell in her daughter's school. This, I love the scene in this photograph from 1962 in far northwest Montana. I interviewed the daughters of these two women who passed away before I began the project. The story uh, there is called on the uh, oral history website, it's called uh, Finding Home in Big Sky Country. In the story called Blood from a Turnip, which is, uh, let's see, could we have the next slide? In the story called Blood from a Turnip, Russ Gaines said that growing up in Louisiana, he was taunted for being half Japanese. 
This is what he said. I didn't want to be Japanese. People are mean to me because I'm Japanese. I don't want to be Japanese. That changed, Russ said, after he was sent by his local church on a missionary trip to Japan. It was his first encounter with other Japanese people. And I went and worked with uh, different families, and I gave my testimony at these different churches and stuff, and I, um, oh, that was a great discovery for me because I had always been told uh, that it's not a good thing to be Japanese. And then I go there and I think, these people are wonderful. I love them. I love this place. In the Townsend family, Daniel talks about wanting to explore more of his, more of his Japanese heritage, which confused his wife. I know more of my black side than I do my Asian side, so now I got to play catch up. There was a period of time, really interesting, about maybe eight, nine years ago when I was trying to figure out, you know, get a little more information on my Asian culture or my Okinawan culture, and I was telling the girls about it and bringing the girls up with it. Maybe be, may have been 10 years ago. And my wife said, well, I wish you would put as much effort into your African-American culture to your kids as you do your Asian, American, Asian culture. And, you know, we had a conversation about it, and I said, well, we're immersed in our African-American culture every day. This is what we live. This is how people look at us and determine who we are, and they, you know, they judge us on it. They don't judge us on the Asian side. And the eight children of Akiko and Clark Hewitt of Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, express different identities. Here's Patrick and Clark Jr., known as Rock. Having an identity as a uh, Japanese American, uh, I, I think you're, we do. I think we're always aware of that, um, especially growing up during that time. Um, for me, um, late 60s, early 70s, where you start forming your memories of w what's happening. Actually, um, the first thing anybody said to me here at Wellsboro when we moved here, um, the first day of school was, uh, even though it was incorrect, it was actually Ho Chi Minh, how's your trail? Was the first word said to me by a student, a kid. You, you gain a sense that people don't understand race. So you, you're always aware, I think, that things are different for you. You have to, you have to try harder. How about you, Clark? For me, I, I think I look more Japanese than anything. So um, I was always identified as Japanese. Friends who say I have enough Japanese pride to float the whole Japanese Navy. And I, I agree with that. I, I am Japanese. <laughs> I'm not sure as I take it to that, because I consider myself American, you know. So um, while we're all within the same family, you do have different perspectives. Finally, the last lesson addresses conflict. The women faced many problems in their marriages, raising their children. Their lives in the United States were not easy and not at all like the Hollywood images they had back in Japan. Nobuku Barkas uh, is described by her daughter as being unhappy with the role of the wife in the 1950s America because she had been raised in a very progressive Japanese family. Here's Julie, her daughter. Well, I think um, part, of the, part of the difference is that she was a woman. And a woman in the 50s um, had a certain role to play. And she had not been raised to, to be like that in, in Japan. The limitations on her as a wife and mother in small town Midwest America at that time, plus the, um, I don't know, the, the expectations that my father had, he was a very young young husband <clears throat> and his his expectations of what she should be doing and her role of course also played heavily into it and she was raised to honor the, the man of the house of course so she was trying to please everybody 
in this country and trying to fit in. She told me that her mother had, had written her letters and said to her, you know, just do what they ask. Do, do what's expected of you. Follow the foot in their footsteps. Obey your, your mother-in-law. She, she tried really, really hard to be an American wife, good, um, good American wife in, in the early years. And what I mostly remember is how unhappy she was. Julie said that the women's movement that started in the 1960s, which Julie came home from school and talked about, gave her mother hope. With Julie's encouragement and despite her husband's objection, Nobuku went back to school to get a degree in business management, ran a Japanese restaurant on Newbury Street in Boston for several years, and finally became dean of student life at the newly established Boston branch of Japan's Showa Women's University. The children of Yukie Hawkins struggled to understand their mother and talked her into agreeing to my interview. She came to the U.S. at the age of 19 and had four children by the time she was 24. Her husband, 16 years older, was gone for long stretches of time, including two tours in Vietnam. They don't know why she married him. Here's B, one of her daughters. So she says that it was, it was the time that people did these kinds of things. Because, I mean, I look at that picture of her standing there on their wedding day, and I, I said, you look like you are frozen and petrified. What made you do this? She, she just said, oh, that's what we did. That's what we did. Not scared of nothing. You, not you, know, you know, because you're 18 years old, you're wild, kind of. I thought he was truthful. That's what I thought, well, okay, I want to go to the United States anyway. Daughter Liz says they were fine parents, even if they were not right for each other. I think my dad was a good guy and was a, a, a nice man, and he was a nice dad. He just wasn't there a lot, and my mom was a nice mom and a good mom and stuff like that. I just don't think they were good together. My mom always said, you know, when you graduate from high school, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. And I kept going, what are you waiting for? <laughs> and it's like, why are you wasting this time? I'm like, just go, live your life. What happened eventually was that Yukie moved out of the house and into a small apartment in Waikiki, where she worked in Japanese restaurants and enjoyed a life surrounded by Japanese friends. Her husband helped her with the move and even bought her a TV. B asked her father if he missed her. He goes, hmm, I miss the aggravation. These stories together create a picture of a group of immigrants, the largest women-only immigration to the United States, and the varied way they made homes and raised their children. They contain broader lessons for U.S. history and culture. I hope that you will draw your own conclusions and lessons as you use these units. The spice material in some of the stories will be included in a traveling exhibition being developed this year by the Smithsonian's Traveling Exhibition Service in conjunction with the National Museum of American History. Its title is Japanese War Brides Across a Wide Divide, and it will start to travel to cities this, this, this December with likely venues in Dallas, Texas, Delray Beach, Florida, Memphis, St. Paul, Minnesota, Baton Rouge, Los Angeles, Honolulu, St. Charles, Louisiana, and Hartford, Connecticut, and hopefully other places. Definite dates will appear on the Traveling Exhibition website. My own mother's experience is captured in the short documentary film, Fall Seven Times, Get Up Eight, The Japanese War Brides. This film came into being through the efforts of two journalist friends who also had Japanese mothers, Lucy Kraft and Karen Kosmowski. They were supportive when I talked of trying to tell my mother's story and they prop proposed that we produce a documentary film. The company Blue Chalk Media helped us launch a Kickstarter campaign to raise money for the film, which tells the war bride story through a mother-daughter lens. Now I'd like to turn the webinar over to curriculum specialist Waka Takahashi Brown, who put together the excellent teacher's guide for the documentary film, and uh, we'll, we'll view its first two minutes first. Thank you.
to put it crudely, Americans did look more attractive. They are well-fed, happy-go-lucky. They had a tremendous appeal to young girls. I wasn't in love with him. I don't even know him. I didn't know anything. I just took a chance. I want to get out. Enemy, who, who's the enemy? You know, I don't know, you know. My mom said, I trust him because he's like father to you. Hope the best. All right, thank you, Catherine, for that excellent, uh, excellent introduction to um, the Japanese War Brides project. And at this time, I'd like to talk to you about the teacher's guide that accompanies the documentary film. Um, I want to make sure there's um, a distinction between the five lessons that accompany the oral history archives, which Catherine talked about, and what I'll talk about next, which is the teacher's guide that accompanies the documentary film. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so in 2021, um, I was approached um, by, well, first my boss who said that um, there was a film called Fall Seven Times, Get Up Eight, The Japanese War Brides, and that we were being asked to develop a teacher's guide for it. And I was very excited to do so. Um, part of my job is to uh, manage and instruct um, a semester long course called Stanford eJapan, and that's to Japanese high school students. But um, the other half of the year, I write curriculum, and I enjoy this tremendously because um, I get to learn about a lot of different topics, many of which I never encountered before, and many of which I never uh, learned when I was growing up. And so um, it's a chance for continuing education. So um, like all uh, SPICE teachers guide, the teachers guide for the War Brides um, documentary contains a list of standards, essential questions and objectives, a list of materials, as well as the materials themselves, step-by-step -step teacher preparation notes and procedures on how to proceed through the lesson, suggestions for assessment, all the handouts you'll need, and of course, answer keys, because um, as teachers, I know it's difficult to find the time to create the answer keys, so at SPICE, we like to do that for you. Now, for the standards, we know that you're often asked to teach toward the standards. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the ones which are covered through the documentary film and the accompanying lessons. But for instance, for the national history standards, we have US history standards, such as assess the challenges, opportunities, and contributions of different immigrant groups. describe military experiences and explain how they fostered American identity and interactions among people of diverse backgrounds. 
identify the major issues that affected immigrants and explain the conflicts these issues engendered. And also for world history, um, describe major patterns of long distance migration of Europeans, Africans, and Asians, and analyze causes and consequences of these movements. Also, um, we have essential questions and objectives. With the essential questions, um, these are the ones that you should consider as you approach this topic. And again, this is just a snapshot. There are more listed in the guide itself, such as who are the Japanese war brides and why are their stories an important chapter in the history of the United States? What are some factors that shape the identities of Japanese war brides? What factors influence identity formation? In what ways can a deeper understanding of our own identities help us to understand other people's perspectives? And so you can see how like the questions start out as somewhat specific, but then broaden so that students can draw their own connections to their own lives. Also with the objectives, this is what your students should be able to do after going through the activities outlined in this guide. For example, They'll learn a general history of Japanese immigration to the United States. In addition, they'll appreciate the challenges that Japanese immigrants, including Japanese war brides, faced in terms of assimilation into U.S. society and recognize how issues of immigration, discrimination, and assimilation are significant issues in U.S. society today. Consider identity-related issues of Japanese war brides who immigrated to the United States and of course, appreciate multiple perspectives. So this is just a list of the materials that accompany the teacher's guide. And um, I can go through the guide by going through the handouts. And this particular activity with the teacher's guide begins before the students view the film. Um, there's a pretest. And um, students are just given this handout in which they are asked to answer these questions. And of course, they won't know the answers, but just tell them to do so um, to the best of their ability. And then without grading, just pick them up and then you'll hold on to these until um, you're done with the lesson. And this, this type of activity helps prepare the students for what's to come and kind of focus um, their learning as to uh, what else they're going to learn in this lesson. And of course, I think it's always helpful to have background information before viewing um, a documentary. And so we have an informational handout in this um, teacher's guide that you can distribute to students. Um, in the procedures, um, students are asked to go over this handout in groups of three and answer questions at the end. And again, you can go over the answers to the questions as a class or collect and assess um, and use as assessment. So after the students are um, equipped with the background knowledge and have kind of been primed for what they're about to learn, this is when we suggest that uh, you show the documentary film. And the film itself is about 25 minutes, which I think is perfect for a 50 minute, one hour um, class that is pretty typical. And instead of just telling students, take notes while you watch the film, we provide note taking sheets in which um, specific questions are asked so they'll know what they need to take notes on. So at this time, if you only have time for one day to teach about uh, Japanese war brides, you can revisit the pretest and look at students' answers, initial answers to their questions. And um, there's an answer key that's also included in the guide in which um, there are also discussion questions. So students can look at their previous answers, then also answer them correctly, and then also launch into a discussion um, pertaining to the questions on the pretest. However, if you have time, there are additional activities um, such as this one, which is the examination of quotes. For this particular one, you would uh, ask the students to divide into five small groups um, about of about five to six students, and each group is handed um, a handout with quotes pulled from the documentary film. And after reading and examining these quotes, each group has some sort 
sort of activity to engage in and uh, also present to the class or just turn in for assessment. So we have an art project, a poetry project, um, a letter to an editor project, um, a collage project, and also a role play project. So a variety of options to choose from. Another activity that's included in the guide is um, an examination of the letters from the filmmakers. Um, the filmmakers were all very kind and they included a letter to educators and students. And so after these letters, we include questions and students can read, uh, answer the questions. And of course, then the next activity, they get to write a letter back. And so um, the template for writing the letter is included here, so you don't have to create it. And then um, you can collect them and the address uh, through which you can mail them is included in the guide. And I'm sure um, Catherine and the other filmmakers would be delighted to receive them. And as I mentioned before, uh, answer keys are provided. And if at this point um, you're able to revisit the pretest, this would be a great way to debrief what the students have learned and launch into a discussion about how maybe they can apply some of these lessons to contemporary society themselves and their own notions of identity. All right, so that is the quick overview of the guide itself. Um, and this is uh, just, I would like to take this opportunity to encourage everyone here um, to teach Asian American history um, to, to about 20 states, um, include some form of ethnic studies that include Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander studies, but some, um, five the last time I checked, have specifically mandated the teaching of Asian American history. And of course, May is a great month to uh, approach some of these topics. Um, and another resource I'd like to point uh, towards is the uh, Asian Americans documentary film series. It's available through PBS and also Amazon Prime if you have it. And um, you can incorporate Asian American history throughout your teachings of history. For example, I just thought of these examples today. If you're going to teach about post-World War II issues and immigration, please consider uh, the Japanese war bride stories with the resources that we presented today. Um, if you're teaching about Ellis Island, I think it's equally important to teach about Angel Island and how that can be, or that has been quite a bit of a different experience. Um, if you're teaching about civil rights, of course, Japanese internment is a great topic to study. If you're looking at Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education, please also look at Tape versus Hurley, which occurred about seven decades prior. And when looking at the Transcontinental Railroad, I think it's extremely important to look at the stories of the Chinese railroad workers who helped create it. And when looking at the 14th Amendment and birthright citizenship, um, please also look at you know, the United States versus Wong Kim Ark. SPICE has all of these topics covered in lessons and units and teacher's guides that you can access for free on our website. If you go to the teaching resources tab, there's full free multimedia resources where you can also see um, Japanese war brides featured there, but this is just a small snapshot of it. There's many, many pages of free resources. And we also have a new um, visual arts and documentary film page. And we highlight uh, a teacher's guide and documentary film at different times of the year. Currently, it's a film on the far west along with its associated teacher's guide. But at the bottom of this page, we have this place where teachers can sign up if you want to be paired with a documentary filmmaker or review something. Um, for them and say how it could be used in the classroom. And also if you're a documentary filmmaker, if you'd like to be paired with an educator to review your film, we have um, forms there where you can sign up. So that is uh, that is the end of my presentation. So I'll turn it back over to Naomi if you would like to facilitate uh, the Q&A. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Catherine and Waka for your 
Fabulous presentation, so much content, um, so many perspectives to consider and to, um, to think about different ways that we can integrate them into our teaching. Um, I want to go ahead and open it up to Q&A. Um, so uh, those of you who are attending, if you'd like to type your questions into the Q&A box, um, we can address them from there. Um, but before we get to that, actually, Catherine, I wanted to ask if you might be able to tell us a little bit more about the oral history archive. Um, we do have uh, some lessons on there that SPICE developed for teachers as well. Um, and I know that those are linked under the For Teachers tab. Um, but if you could tell us a little bit more about that um, and how it was developed, and then um, we can encourage teachers uh, to go to the site itself um, and to look for, under the, um, the teacher's guides for more sort of guided practice for classroom use. Um, but I think as just, um, you know, a community resource too, it's just really interesting. Right. It isn't a traditional um, oral history uh website in the sense that it's 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 very curated it's it's in these um I, I conduct the interviews which are you know multiple hours and then i take uh pieces of the interview that uh that tell a story uh that tell part of the story uh and then i combine that with with photos that i've scanned from the family so I try to make it more uh, accessible in that way. The typical oral history archives are are long, long interviews, um, and it's it's amazing um, primary source material. Obviously, Den Show is is sort of one of the gold standards for that um, for the Japanese American experience, and they, you know, they have the transcripts and everything. Being a journalist, I took a different approach and and wanted to to combine sort of the presenting of oral history and 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 storytelling at, at the same time. And for the Japanese war brides, I think it was a useful way to do it because there isn't a story around the Japanese war brides that's well known. And so I I try to I try to tell that story and and it's. It's a complicated one with, um, you know, that it's not easy to say what what sort of the outcomes were for 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 the marriages because the there's been you know sort of no um, you know it's it's all anecdotal in that sense, um, but I think that um, uh, but I think that it's extremely useful and it does start to create a storyline about that period of immigration and that you can see that they came from different kinds of families they entered different kinds of marriages landed in all sorts of communities uh and you know you begin to understand why things worked out the way they did for different people and you know who helped them or what were the factors that contributed to 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 their 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 lives um, so, so that's what the oral history tries to do in the way that I've, that I've produced it, uh, to, uh, to, to, to create a story, to create a narrative, uh, that where one doesn't exist really right now, I think, um, uh, you know, it takes, a, it takes a long time to do it this way, uh, to, you know, to, to take these stories and figure out what what the what the story is, what the kernel is in this interview that that adds to the overall picture, uh, but uh, uh, but I I feel like it's been fairly effective in that sense. Um, yeah, I was wondering also if you could speak to um, some of the challenges that you faced in drawing some of the stories. Out of these women, um, you know, I know that from my from my own grandmother, you know, it's not something that that part of her past isn't something that she was um, you know, very forthcoming about. Um, I know that's not uncommon, um, and so I was just wondering what some of the um, the challenges were that you experienced in developing, um, you know, and capturing all of these these stories. Right. So the the children were my allies uh, because their children wanted to know the stories, the children and they're sometimes the grandchildren. Uh, the women didn't think that they had a story. They 
they, uh, you know, they didn't understand why there would be interest in in their lives. Uh, so, so that was part of it. Some of them had very specific requests, like one woman agreed to an interview as long as her husband wasn't in the room. I mean, she, you know, she wanted to she wanted to be totally private. Uh, others were. Uh, you know, agreed and then changed their mind and then were talked into it again by 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 their kids. Uh, not everybody can tell their story well, and you sometimes you you know somebody's got a good story, but they don't tell it well. There's in every family there there is a storyteller though, and if you could find the person who can tell the family's story or tell the mother's story, then that that's that's where you know. That that's what makes it work, uh, and I've I've you know I look for those people in the families, and that's why some stories are told by a daughter or a son. Uh, the the women themselves, they're they're well, they were I, unfortunately many of them had passed even, but when I had started the project, uh, and those now who are 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 still around are in their nineties, late eighties, early nineties. Uh, so yeah, um, they, it's, it's, but once you get somebody, you sit down with somebody with a microphone and you just, you just start chronologically and you ask about their family in Japan and what they were, you know, what, what it was like growing up and what their parents did. And, you know, it's, 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 it's not hard to, to sort of build a story out of that. And then, you know, what they knew of their husbands and, and his family. Uh, so you start sort of chronologically, but then there's always sort of that moment of emotion that you realize that you've you've touched something in their lives that that made a difference that mattered to them. So the moment when they realize something, or you know, they um, because they they made these decisions without a lot of information. You know, they 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 kind of went with their gut when they decided to come. Did you find um, through hearing these stories, did a lot of these women and their children stay close with their relatives in Japan or did it vary quite a bit or, you know, what, what was the, the connection um, between that next generation um, and Japan? Yeah, it's interesting because at the time, of course, you know, the communication was letters and phone calls were very expensive. And where it varied was on the resources, the family resources, um, uh, whether they could afford a phone call or whether they could afford a return trip. As some uh, men stayed in the military and were able to uh, manage to have another tour in Japan or Okinawa. And so then they were able to go back and, and see relatives. Uh, others, who who feel very close to Japan and who say, you know, my soul is Japanese, never went back, not even once. Uh, and part of that is, you know, the feeling that, you know, it's it's when you go to Japan, there are so many obligations, you take so many gifts and it's too complicated. Uh, so a number of women never went back. The in those cases, I, th I think the children do not have uh, that much of a connection to their Japanese relatives, uh, but I find that they want that connection, and and I've seen you know recently in several cases where you know with Google Translate and everything. I mean, they are there are families where the kids are really building uh, a relationship with their cousins, and um, and. And it, and it matters to them a great deal uh, to know to know the Japanese family. Um, yeah, I think that that's, you know, because, you know, in their case, the Japanese side is very close. It's 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 their it's their grandmother. They have a grandmother and a grandfather who are Japanese, whether they knew them or not. Now, of course, the women didn't teach their children Japanese for the most part. Uh, because there was so much pressure on them to become American, and they tried so hard to learn English, and their husbands mostly didn't speak Japanese and didn't want them to use Japanese at home. So the kids have that uh, obstacle in communicating with their Japanese relatives. But 
But I have to say today with Google Translate, so much seems to be possible. I mean, there's, you know, texts and phone calls and, you know, and visits and this, this, uh, the Montana story where I showed that picture of the two women in kimono in 1962 in Northwest Montana. Uh, one of the women, her daughter, uh, this past fall welcomed a group of her Japanese relatives decided to come and visit her mother's grave in Montana. And, you know, this Wakago's daughter, Kat, doesn't speak Japanese, and but she managed to take them all to Kalispell, Montana, and they went to the grave. And um, yeah, so that connection is sort of, it, it was a huge sort of moment, I think, in the family that uh, that the Japanese family would come to you know, to to pay their respects to uh, to the sister who married the American and left so so many years ago, um, you know. And this uh, just last fall, I was um, I was in Japan with a with a family from Wisconsin who had gone to uh, to visit their mother's sister. So there's there's a lot of that that that's happening, and um, um, so that's interesting to see. The other the other thing is names. I mean, I see that the women didn't give their their kids Japanese names, but but the grandkids have Japanese names, <laughs> and and that is sometimes the the children themselves pick those names, or in some cases, the you know the the Japanese woman maybe regretted not giving any Japanese names to her kids. So when the grandkids came along, she said they're going to have a Japanese name, and so there was one name in there that would be Japanese. Um, yeah, so the, the the connections between you know relatives and sort of the you know what happens in the next generations is 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 fascinating. Thank you for sharing those. A lot of that resonates um, with me and my own family too. Um, my my mother um, is the only one of her siblings who married uh, someone from Japan, and so her connection with Japan, and then of course my connection and my sister's connection with Japan is much um, closer, I would say, because of that. Um, you know, we're three quarters Japanese, um, whereas most of my cousins are a quarter Japanese. Um, and so, you know, the, those types of connections and then where that's sort of filtered down through language and um, different cultural practices that we practice at home. Um, you know, my own children um, are Japanese and American and Chinese, um, but I gave them Japanese first names because they uh, have a Chinese last name. Um, and so these different ways in which we try to, um, you know, instill sort of their backgrounds and cultures um, as generations pass, I think is really fascinating um, and will continue to be um, increasingly. So, you know, as different um, cultures continue to mix. Yeah, the um, names there are, are fascinating. Oh, the names are fascinating because the Japanese women themselves took American names. I mean, they were given American names as nicknames sometimes or just because it was easier. So they were called Barbara and Nancy and, you know, these names that had nothing to do with their Japanese names. And that's how they were viewed and lived their lives here. You know, K, K is a common one. But, um, yeah, Barbara and Nancy and, you know, Peggy and that's so... You know, to give up a name like that is 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 really um, remarkable. But the woman in Montana who who was called Katie always put her Japanese name on her her license plate on her car, so her car says Wakako. <laughs> so she was going to claim it there. I'm sorry. So do we have some uh, other questions? Yeah, we have a couple questions in the box. Um, so the first one is uh, I don't need you can probably see this, but I'll read it aloud. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentations, Catherine and Waka. Can you share more about the Smithsonian exhibition? Will there be a display of artifacts? How are the sites determined? And would you consider taking the exhibition to Japan? So the exhibit, the exhibit is is being developed now. Uh, so this year is the development year, and it it will be you know relatively small. It won't. It will have. Uh, some physical objects that will be more like uh, reproductions than original artifacts, because uh, in order to keep the exhibit uh, 
uh, as a low security exhibit to ship it around. Uh, it, they did not want to have to sort of take valuable things and insure them. Uh, and the, the Japanese war bride story is one that I think is told more through voice and photograph than object. Uh, but we're thinking about that now. I mean, there are things that are that are great to to look at. I mean, the 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 bride school textbooks and certificates and um, and all of that and things that you know what mattered to them. What did they bring? Uh, but it it strikes me that the story is not as object driven uh, as as other exhibits could be. Uh, so it'll be multimedia for sure. Uh, and my uh, uh, use of the audio today in the slideshow uh, is is the kind of thing that I hope that we can do with the exhibit where you have, you know, photographs and you could hear people's voices. Um, so yeah, so that's so that's being developed right now. And um, uh, the plans for travel, I mean, they so it. It would travel for several years, for ten weeks at a time, and so a venue would then contact you know the the sites, uh, the the traveling exhibition service, and express interest and um, and you know see how much it cost. And so uh, there has been several people have asked us as about the possibility of taking it to Japan, and I certainly hope that that would would happen at some point. Yeah, so it's pretty, you know, it's pretty, you know, exciting to think about the exhibition and uh, the Stanford educational material, Spice's educational material is something that we um, are promoting as part of the, uh, as part of the exhibition package, uh, because we do want it to be, you know, educational. Um, so, yeah, so that was big to have that curriculum and teachers guide developed. Great, thank you. Um, the next question uh, and comment is, thank you for your insightful presentation. Um, through this webinar, I was reminded of how significant family history is in identity formation. How might you suggest a grandchild to start exploring their grandparents' history? Wow. So the you know, I think that they're teaching a lot how to do these kinds of interviews in schools. Uh, that the grand it's and it's so easy today to record. Uh, I would start by looking at photographs uh, and seeing, you know, sit down with a grandparent and and ask to see the photographs and talk about the photos, uh, and have the grandparent explain, you know, what they are, where they were taking, what was happening that day. And then you start to get a picture of life at another time. And, you know, I think also family trees are interesting. Uh, that's, that's uh, uh, you know, a fascinating kind of way to to map out, you know, where where you are and, and, and you know, the grandparents, parents, and, you know, take it back that way. Um, yeah, I think, I think that um, exploring the grandparents' histories and lives is super important. And, and I think, um, you know, it's, I don't think it's that hard to do. You just have to, you have to make the time to do it and take advantage of all, of all the kinds of tools there are today. I mean, you know, phones can do very good recordings. Great, thank you. And our next question uh, is from a high school student. Um, thank you for your presentation. Ms. Tolbert, is there a particular story and or interview that stood out to you? You know, the first story that I did was called Courting the Typist, and that was the Hewitt story in Wellsboro. Uh, and it, it, it remains one of my favorites. It's very short, but I just felt the kind of the youthful kind of innocence of these two people at that time in Japan. Um, and she, you know, this kind of interest and perhaps longing for a different kind of life and his infatuation and trying to convince her to go on a date with him. 
so so I still that was the first one I completed and I and I still like it a lot the one I the most recent one I completed is also the longest one and that's about uh the mother of the uh, the fencer Peter Westbrook uh who runs a foundation in New York City to teach fencing and is a six-time Olympian but his mother was a Japanese war bride who um who raised her two kids in uh in Newark New Jersey so that's the most recent one uh you know they I've been doing since since 2015 so sometimes I forget the details and when I prepare a presentation like this to go back and listen to some of the audio again or to look at the transcripts uh I I, I there are a lot of them that I like and you know so um you know I don't have a favorite each one is each one could be longer and and I really struggled to keep them keep them short uh, there's this, the voice, one of the voices I like a lot is the one, uh, Finding My Father, uh, is by Kyoko Katayama, um, in St. Paul, uh, because she talks, she was somebody whose, uh, mother was abandoned and who, ra and so she didn't know who her father was until she was an adult and found him, but, uh, but she looks at that kind of war bride experience and she's the one who speaks about the term war bride. And it, the war bride term is a little controversial uh, applied to Japanese because it wasn't during the war that they married. It was after the war uh, and they married men who were there for the occupation or who were fighting in Korea. Uh, so, but they, they, um, we use the term because it describes the experience to me of being married to an American serviceman and coming to this country uh, from a country that the U.S. was at war with at one point. So that's why I think that it still works and is, and is a useful term. And before we go on to the last question, actually, Waka, I wanted to ask you, um, I know that you have written a lot of different curriculum materials on a lot of different topics, um, but, you know, as someone who teaches and as someone who writes um, and as someone who is the daughter of immigrants, I was wondering if there was anything particular um, about working on this project that you found um, particularly, you know, memorable or notable, um, you know, as you were kind of going through the process of, of writing the guide for the film? Yeah, this was actually one of my favorite projects to work on. Um, my parent, my mom wasn't a Japanese war bride, but my parents immigrated, um, I believe it was like 1970, and it was pretty much a direct result of the 1965 Immigration Act. And so um, my mom had friends who were war brides. And I remember being curious because there weren't many Japanese people around, but then there were these half Japanese families um, here and there. And so I was always kind of curious about their story. And um, yeah, one of my best friends in middle school, I believe her mom, uh, her, she met her husband when he was stationed in Japan. I want to say uh, right after he was just stationed there, but it wasn't due to a war, but like, yeah, so it was finding these pieces that I'd always wondered about. Um, and some of the experiences were similar in my family, but at least with my mom and dad, like they had a common cultural background. And so there weren't any um cultural, I guess, misunderstandings between the them. But um, those became like parental to student uh, to child, like those cultural misunderstandings were happening there. But um, yeah, it was a very interesting project. And one that, um, you know, I saw parallels with uh, some of the things my parents went through. But it was interesting that um, the assimilation, like the the uh, pressure to assimilate. Um, my mom, I think my dad was just, 
he didn't really care. <laughs> but my mom was very adamant that we not assimilate all the way. So, I mean, that's why my siblings and I have Japanese names. That's why we grew up speaking Japanese. And, you know, there was no, like, I want to learn English, so let's speak English more. No, like my mom's English probably um, only became quite good when uh, she decided to take a job teaching Japanese at a local high school. And then her English improved a lot, but yeah, she she definitely want us, wanted us to keep our Japanese um, identities strong. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Okay, um, there's one final question here in the Q&A. Um, is the difficulty in communication between Japanese and English still a major obstacle or are there organizations that can help facilitate overseas visits and gene genealogical research translation and interpretation services for families? Um, I know you talked about um, sort of the the blossoming of technology <laughs> as an aid in this, but um, I, I wasn't sure about organizations that um, that might be supportive in these efforts. Yeah, I I don't know of organizations, and I and people have asked because there are uh, there are people who who want to know, or there are people who don't know who their uh, Japanese parent is. I mean, who maybe was given up for adoption, or uh, so. But the, but it it's difficult in Japan to to trace to trace that. I mean, unless you're a, a proven relative, I don't think you can easily get uh, family histories or or. And uh, you know, here we can find out so much through you know twenty three and uh, twenty three and me and these other kind of uh, ancestry searches, and so so many people, you know use them that you can find relatives that way but as far as i know you you that doesn't happen in japan i don't know do you know waka anything different about that i don't know of any sources um resources specifically for genealogical research but i do know there are international associations like a lot of jet um jet program participants like i was worked in um international associations in various cities. And um, those associations are there for non-Japanese um, residents, um, if they have any issues, if they need translation services, if they need some help um, just kind of generally making their way um, in a Japanese speaking society. So um, if you're in Japan, uh, I think that's a good place to kind of look into. Um, I think all the prefectural offices do have an international division. And so um, they could probably point you towards other international associations that might be government affiliated. That might be a good place to start. I did hear that Okinawa uh, was more helpful, that there was uh, some kind of prefectural office in Okinawa that helped uh, non-Japanese or, you know, try to find relatives. Uh, and um, I, I might have done an Instagram post on that. I, I can't I can't remember, but I, it was striking to me that 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 was that was a possible way to um, to find relatives. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm really inspired by the women um, that you spoke about and that we heard from today. And, you know, the thinking back on those times um, and the decisions that had to be made and the bravery, um, you know, that they had to, to have within themselves to embark on these adventures um, and the families that that came from them. You know, there's just so much, uh, so much richness um, in these stories. And I hope that teachers will be able to take these uh, and bring them to their students to help bring some of this history to life. Um, I, I always think, and I, you know, working with teachers over the years, we've always heard that uh, that's really the best way to, to teach about history is through the power of personal narrative. Um, so, you know, thank you, Catherine, for developing um, these incredible resources, the archive and the documentary film um, that make it possible for teachers to bring these stories to students and to, to spread them um, among the younger generations. So thank you so much. And thank you, Waka, for all of your efforts on the curriculum 
um, and the guide. And I hope that a lot of the teachers who are here today will be able to use them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Naomi. Well, thank you. Um, oh, I just wanted to, I neglected to, uh, to mention at the beginning of our session today that this uh, webinar is also sponsored by the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia and also the USC US China Institute. Um, so we thank our colleagues at those organizations as well. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the recording link will be uh, made available, I believe, through the SPICE website. Um, so uh, if you'd like to watch it again, um, I encourage you to do so. And all of the links to the documentary film and to the teacher's guides and to the oral history archive are available on the SPICE website as well. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We greatly appreciate it and have a great evening wherever you are.